Hi, my name is Jay Reed. I'm a psychotherapist in San Francisco, California. And today I'd like to talk about reclaiming your anger after narcissistic abuse. When one has faced narcissistic abuse from a parent or a partner, one's own ability to recognize and profitably use your anger can get disrupted. And today I'd like to talk about how that comes to be and also how that ability to recognize and use your anger can be incrementally restored. So let's start with why one often has to learn to avoid and or deny one's own anger in the course of being a abused by someone who's narcissistic. Well, if there's an imbalance in power between the narcissist and the survivor, which there inherently is when, when the, when the um, narcissist is a parent and that the survivor is a child, and oftentimes even between adults, and but one of them is narcissistic, enough tactics get employed that it's experienced as though there's an imbalance in power where the narcissist holds the power and the, uh, the other person doesn't. So when that's in case, Anger is sort of a non-starter for the survivor. Consider the child with a narcissistic parent. The child needs to find a way to believe that the narcissistic parent is willing to care for him or her. I mean, that's a matter of survival. And this, this point about believing that your parent is willing to care for you, I think is a really important one. There's a guy, Alan Rappaport, who wrote about this in the, a group here in the Bay Area. And in essence, it's like the child's determination of, of, is my parent willing to care for me if and when I need them? That's a matter of existential security for the child. And the child will do and believe sort of anything to make sure the answer to that question is yes for him or her. And then let's consider just how fragile the narcissist's self-esteem is in normal just ebbs and flows of everyday life. They carry that deep sense of worthlessness and any failure for others to comply with the antidotal sense of inflated superiority results in a profound, I think, collapse within themselves, but that gets manifested by devaluing those around them so they feel propped up again. So they can feel easily wounded just by sort of, you know, someone not showing over overt amounts of deference to them. So in that kind of psychological ecology, there's really no room for the other person, the survivor in this case, to get angry and for that narcissistic person to accept and respond helpfully to that anger. The narcissist will, I would submit, would likely uh, deny, devalue, or dismiss the angry party. And if that's not possible, then they will likely abandon or, and or reject that party. And, you know, for the child, that can't happen. They need that parent, psychologically speaking, uh, to survive. So they have to avoid that outcome at all costs. So in this way, it's sort of adaptive for the child to stow away their anger uh, felt towards the parent because that parent is so, again, fragile, they cannot take it. And what's worse is they will then uh, come down even harder on the child or even threaten them with the worst, which is to just discard or dismiss the child who fails to prop up that artificially inflated self-concept that the narcissist carries around. So in short, it's just too dangerous for the child to feel their anger, let alone recognize how useful it is to have access to our anger in the world. And just a, a point that maybe underscores what feeling at odds with one's anger after narcissistic abuse. In my practice, I use data collection at the outset of treatment and in an ongoing way to sort of augment what we're doing in, in the therapy. And, you know, most folks come with the goal of recovering from a narcissistic abuse of some form or another. And in part of that data collection, I ask folks to write uh, their goals for the therapy. And then I have a scale of beliefs. And these are the kinds of beliefs that tend to stand in our way of those goals. And they're very much like the kinds of beliefs talked about in other videos that the scapegoat a child might, might hold, like I am defective or I'm always one mistake away from complete ruin, those kinds of beliefs. And there's about 23 of these beliefs that people can endorse. This is really helpful just in working together to, to chart the roadmap for treatment, first of all. But it also affords some learnings from a, from a data uh, analytic perspective of like, um, what are the most commonly held beliefs according to this scale, like in this sample of, of, of individuals. And what I found in looking at it is that three of the most commonly endorsed beliefs 
actually have to do with anger. The three beliefs are, I fear hurting others' feelings if I express anger. I fear to be wrong when showing anger. And I come into conflict if I express anger. So I just thought that was an important piece of information that really supports just how dangerous it can feel to get into touch with one's own anger coming out of narcissistic abuse. I think the belief of I fear to be wrong when showing anger is particularly important because survivors of uh, narcissistic abuse, I think, have likely face the response from the narcissist that there's something destructive, unfounded, even crazy about their anger or the reasons why they are angry. And, it, and as that takes root and happens again and again, the survivor may kind of reflect on the times they happen to have gotten angry and kind of carry that narrative and sort of uh, offer it up as like, well, when I've gotten angry, I, I really flew off the handle and I said this or that to this person or I did this or that. And, you know, what I found at least, again, this is anecdotally, but in no cases has someone actually physically harmed somebody. And in 90, like 9.9% .9 of cases, when someone's coming out of narcissistic abuse, there's a, a vast overestimation of the damage done in getting angry in the times that they have, than actually, at least from my understanding of what they're saying actually transpired. But that characterization of their anger as sort of like strange, wrong-headed, or, or particularly destructive, all I think can be derived from the, the this other more primary rule that has to be there when suffering narcissistic abuse, and that is that uh, they cannot own their own power in the world, because that would be too threatening to the narcissist. And anger is one way we kind of know and exercise our power in the world. It's not a destructive emotion. It's very evolutionarily adaptive. It informs us when we need to be ready to protect ourselves, protect people we're close to, identify and correct an unfairness in our immediate environment or something noxious. And knowing and embracing that signal would very much, I think, pose a threat to the narcissist. And what can often happen is the narcissist will grow extremely retaliative and kind of preemptively punitive to deter the survivor from accessing and utilizing their anger. And most importantly, feeling right when they are angry. One particularly insidious tactic that a narcissist can use to do this is that of goading. In, the, in that case, it's uh, a narcissist will say something very provocative, angering to the survivor, and in a way that sort of just is meant to infuriate uh, that survivor. And when the survivor has the natural reaction of anger or even outrage, the narcissist will step back and be like, whoa, you've got a real temper, right? I'm, you're scaring me. I don't know what, what this is all about. You know, an example uh, that comes to mind is sort of of a uh, say like an, an adolescent male who talked about, you know, every time he'd sort of make plans with friends, right before he's about to leave, his mother might say, oh, here's a list of chores I need you to do. And he would just grow astonished in her lack of sensitivity and care for what he was about to go do and how much he was looking forward to that and would grow very angry. And then she would, you know, make that into the problem, his, his mother, who was, seems narcissistic, and say, you know, uh, yeah, uh, this person, this son, my son, um, w will scream and yell at me, uh, and um, for no reason. And so, this person, as they went into therapy, had to work together with the therapist to counter that belief that there was something sort of overblown and misguided about his anger, and over time grow to possess it as something he gets to have in the world. Again, all these examples are completely anonymous, and they're like composites kind of through life and practice, so just a caveat. So what can be done to kind of recover one's access to one's rightful anger and have that in their tool belt as they go about life following narcissistic abuse? I think therapy can be particularly helpful in this regard because it's often important to have somebody else there to offer genuine validating reactions to situations that you find angering. Friendships can certainly offer that, good relationships as well. I think therapy especially can really help folks 
dig into their own reactions in in situations and and kind of look at well th- this is how I usually react to to a situation where I feel angry, which might include undermining their own anger or or, or shying away from it. And a therapist who's versed in this kind of recovery from narcissistic abuse, and I think generally most therapists would. I think be likely to question, well, why, why inhibit your anger here? If it's justified, it seems like you have every right to be angry. And that's a very powerful and corrective experience to be had uh, after this type of abuse. And again, I say it well, probably every video here, but noticing and tracking your breath when you're angry, because that adds a sort of level of continuity and manageability to the anger, which may not have been felt before. I would I would offer that it's, it's going to be uh, pretty uncommon that one finds oneself as angry as they found themselves in relation to the narcissist, if, particularly if that narcissist used goading as one of their tactics. I think a narcissist can, has ways to just do things that are just so over-the-top, mind-blowingly uh, angering, and that's just not typically the way... Uh, I would I would argue at least that's just not typically how the kinds of anger we find ourselves experiencing in the sort of broader world. And then third, I think developing sort of a healthy skepticism towards reactions of invalidation or pathologizing of your own anger, checking out evidence. Well, I I think I got I really blew my lid in that meeting, and asking maybe a trusted colleague, hey, did I <clears throat> did I come across as too too angry in there? And you know find out what they say and you know if this is the issue where it's like trying to recover your own right to anger i suspect most of the time it's going to be yeah it it doesn't get nearly noticed in the way that is feared by others and therefore you have maybe a lot more room to run in terms of utilizing your anger and it, and letting it inform some of your interactions where you find it useful well thanks for watching today's video And again, I want to thank everybody for your continued support of the channel and these videos and engagement with them. And I look forward to posting another one next week, Sundays at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Take care.